I see James popping his head. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, it's another Friday. That means another webinar slash laser jam session or laser review. One of one of the the following. I have my laser friend Don. <laughs> hey Don, how's it going? Oh, and you're muted. Sorry, I, I muted you. There you go. Uh, <laughs> how are you feeling this morning? <laughs> Good. What well, you saw? I'm uh, on some of these special Fridays. I get to like steal a, a corner office to get to do the laser jam. So I feel very spoiled when I get to do this. Oh, that's it's right. Really, that's really right. nice. <laughs> well, welcome to another Friday. Uh, let, let's bring our, our usual suspects in. We have Mr. James from Vancouver. Hey, everybody. Hey, James. <laughs> How you feeling this morning? Best day ever. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be every day. 8 a.m. on a Friday. It was better than <laughs> better than, than yesterday, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, well, we have uh, Mr. Mike Clark. Hey, Mr. Mike. Mike. Thank Mike. you for joining us. He How are you feeling this morning? He Can forgot to the headphones. No, Mike? he can't. He can't hear us. <laughs> oh, and he got stuck. Okay. Well, <laughs> he's well, lost in time. We'll, we'll we'll bring Mike back as soon as uh, we have some better internet. Uh, anyways, without further ado, we have our very very special guest, Mr. Mark Lanjo from Schooner Labs out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Welcome, Mark. How are you? Good. Good. Good morning. Afternoon. Midday. Uh, how's uh, how's the weather? And the same to you. <laughs> so we're we're actually coast to coast. So James on the on the west, and you're on the east, and we're kind of in the middle. That's that's pretty interesting. That's uh, what is it? Uh, Twelve o'clock down there in Halifax. Yeah, it's just noon here now. So if I was downtown, I'd get to hear the gun, but uh, not the gun. Not where I? Yeah, they fire off the gun from Citadel Hill at noon. Oh, cool! I didn't know that. I was yeah. in Halifax for a couple of days a while back. Oh, I think Mike yeah. is back. Hey, Mike, can you hear hey. us now? Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, no, no worries. <laughs> no okay. worries. I'm on the okay. global WAN, and it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. So we have. Uh, hey, I, I guess. Yeah, we we already made hey all there, the Mike. intros. <laughs> Mike, you were just a bit late, but that's okay. Um, so. Um, I guess Scooter Labs. If you want to tell us a little bit about the business, and I could show folks. Uh, I guess starting with the website, we'll take a look at the Etsy store and we'll, we'll get deep into the, the business. Uh, do you sure. want to give us a brief? I mean, how did you start Schooner Labs? What is it? And so on and so forth. Yeah, it's probably been, I guess, maybe five or six years ago. The Kind of the idea of Schooner Labs got started, which was more, my background is in IT. So I've been a software developer for about 25 years. Um, started to get tired of doing programming and on the computer 24 hours a day um, and want to do more stuff on, on more hands-on uh, making side. Uh, my family and father has always been into building and making stuff. We built windmills, ultralights, um, you name it, growing up. And then so Schooner Labs really just evolved out of that, starting to do a few side projects of building custom pieces for, be it for drone work or, you know, just, you know, some small pieces, some CNC work. Um, and then, so it just really evolved from that. And then as part of that was really wanting to add a laser for pr pretty much half of my life. I've always wanted a laser. So it was eventually got to the point where it's like, yeah, I'll bite the bullet and, uh, you know, could kind of go down that path and, and, uh, add a laser to it. And then that's really kind of since then the schooner labs of kind of what it is over the last say year and a half to two years has really been more focused on the laser. Um, just, just as kind of the business evolved from that, it was really, you know, starting to do more and more on the laser and seeing what it could do. And that's, that's kind of what, um, it is today. Um, as you'll see on there, there's some other stuff too. We, like I said, we do some drone work that's with my other company flight lab, but kind of the, the building or modifying side, I kind of pushed schooner labs. And we also, we also have an ROV, um, used to resell for them currently not with the kind of cold COVID thing and the way the industry's gone, I've kind of backed away from the ROV market just because it's. Sorry, what? what I, I'm I'm pretty ignorant to that. What, what's an ROV? Um, ROV is basically an underwater drone. Oh um, wow! So a little mini submarine. Um, so it's uh, it was extension really of what we did on the drone side. So wanting something to uh, you know do do some underwater photography and video as well so we kind of we have it as a tool now basically it's it, 
we use it now and again. It's not it's not big on our list just because um, the logistics of having to go out and do something with an ROV is a little bit more involved than what it is with a drone. So it's just it's there's more work involved in it. So it's kind of I wouldn't say I have a haven't mothballed the idea, but if a project comes up, we have it available basically. Lev, do you think we have the uh, the the um, budget to get one of these? Uh, <laughs> I can I can see many engraving <laughs> machine uses for this. Yes, yeah. underwater. Yeah, I can, I can see uh, James's uh, eyes light say, up. Artifacts I looks it. different underwater than I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I mean, can you? I don't know if you could talk about pricing, but how much do these things go for? Uh, what you're seeing there now, and that that's Blue Robotics. So they they were a company. They're based out of San Diego. Um, that was really spun off originally. They were basically, um, I think, a master's degree program from some students that built wanted to build a system that was not a million dollars. Um, where basically, we have, there's this joke in the underwater world is is once you go underwater, there's an underwater tax, so everything costs <laughs> ten times more than it would what you think it would cost. Um, with the blue R. ROV, it starts around three thousand dollars. So you can, well, in the, no. yeah, and there are cheaper ones now. Like the market has really changed. Like two or three years ago, Blue Robotics and maybe one or two other ones were the kind of only true entry level pieces. Now there's probably, you know, a, do a dozen different companies out there. It's it's kind of like the drone market was five years ago. It was like you know. Originally, you would build it yourself or you didn't do it. Now you can just go, you know, you can go online and buy a drone. You can go online now and buy an ROV. Um, so it's it's kind of, it's that market's evolved a lot over the last few years. And, and what percentage uh, would it be between Schooner Labs and, you know, the CNC and the drone stuff? I mean, how, how do you kind of divide your time with, the, with these businesses? It varies. I mean, the, the drone market is very cyclical. We'll go through periods where we might be busy, you know, have a job every week for a while, but then over the winter it gets kind of slow. And surprisingly, midsummer is usually slow. But we hit hit fall. Um, we get we do a lot of stuff for tourism, and we do a lot of industrial work. Um, so we do stuff with um, shipyards. We do stuff with the container pier. So it really depends on if they have a project that's going on. So we recently uh, been doing a lot of work with the container pier. They just built uh, a large extension to their pier so they can take on the post Panamax ships. So we've been doing a lot of aerial work for them where we're going in and just basically, you know, here, here's the big new crane, here's a large ship arriving. They want to get coverage of that. So it's, uh, it it comes and goes, so it's 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 certainly we don't do it full time, um, but it like I say it varies. So it's Schooner Labs of the two is probably the more consistent business because it's an ongoing. I'm selling pieces, uh, where the other ones are very much is more service driven. Um, so it could be, you know, you could get a call for two jobs the same week, or you may not hear anything for a month. So it mm -hmm. it, it really varies, and particularly down here in in the Maritimes, it's we have no real big industry um, where if you're in Toronto, there's a lot of people doing more real estate with drones because there's just more activity out West. When the oil price was higher, there was a lot of work done in the oil patch that's slowed a bit, but again, we don't have that one big industry. So it's a little bit of everything from, you know, like I say, tourism, or uh, it might be real estate. It might be, um, you know, industrial, but it's, there's no one industry you could really go into and say, I'm going to focus on shipbuilding and that'll be all I do with drones. It's just, it, we just don't have the reality of that down here in the Maritimes. So the majority now is more, uh, more towards the, the online business, like the, the schooner labs. Exactly. And that's really mm -hmm. been my focus because it, it's something that's a little bit easier to grow where it's not, I'm not dependent on service service clients where if there's a downturn in the economy, they may not, may not want to hire someone for drones because it's, it's seen as an add-on in a lot of ways. Um, where the online store, again, it's impacted by the economy, but I found it it's more consistent. I can pretty much judge now on a, a weekly basis how many sales I'm going to have you know, for the most part. So it's, it's more predictable and it's something that it's a little easier to scale. And the fact that I can add new products, you know, I can, you know, the more I want to put into it in terms of trying to advertise it or, you know, that sort of thing, it's, it's a little bit more of a straight path. None Sorry, James, you had a question? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, how, how did you, 
get into, uh, I guess, can you explain a little bit about these uh, tabletop gaming? I mean, I've seen these uh, for, for years now on, on your um, on your social media. Uh, I, I know a little bit about, I mean, the Warhammer stuff, but if you could give people that don't know anything about tabletop gaming uh, a kind of brief overview what it is and what kind of products you make for them. Sure. So the, the bulk of really what I have on my Etsy store now is really it's focused on basically miniature tabletop and, and some board gaming as well and also some kind of role playing um, accessories like for Dungeons and Dragons, which a lot of people would know, um, do some of that. The bulk that I do is for Warhammer, um, mainly because it's just it owns a large piece, portion of the market. And the miniature gaming in or miniature gaming in general is uh, basically a bunch of older kids um, <laughs> that never grew up that like to play with toys. Um, so it's a lot, it's a lot of people that maybe grew up wanting to build models and paint models. Um, so there's a lot of people that are in it that just like it from the hobby side. So they buy the models, they buy the miniatures and they like to build and paint them. Um, then they also want to play a game with them. And that's really where kind of tabletop war gaming is a little bit different. It's kind of like you build your models and then you get to play with them. So it's, it's basically toy soldiers for grownups. Cool. Um, that sounds like people, our marketing department. <laughs> 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 Just never grew up. Oh, and, I and love it's it. Really, yeah, and it's really that's kind of the mindset of I would say everyone, but I mean it's it's everyone that's trying to be a kid at heart, so they want to want to keep playing. But it's the demographic is really slanted more on the older side. Although it looks like it's a bunch of toys, it's probably you know people in their people usually get into it kind of when they're younger, so they'll get into it maybe in high school with friends. Um, they'll go through university and then they'll start doing other things like drinking and partying and life like gets dark. in the way <laughs> and then usually once everyone kind of it seems to be the, the the trend is and then people start settling down with a family and then they kind of say hey i'd like to get back into my old hobbies um so then it has this big uptick where you'll start getting people you know 30 40 50 60 want to get into it because it's something they've done in the past um with me it's a bit different because i never did war gaming when i was younger um i was introduced to it i knew always knew about it but it wasn't something I get into. I'm not sure why, because I've always I built you know model cars and model planes uh, when I was a kid, and, and built RCR planes growing up. So I've always been in that, but never got into kind of the game playing side. Um, and then a couple of years ago, after I had got the laser, um, a friend of mine had started asking, "He's like, hey, could you make this for Warhammer?" <laughs> and then really, it's basically just grown from there because it was like, oh this is something I didn't really know about in terms of like, Hey, we could make stuff for it. Um, and then it just, it's really a rabbit hole of, you know, like I say, Warhammer is probably the biggest one, which the bulk of my stuff is for, but then once you kind of go down that path, there's so many other third party games from, um, stuff from Marvel now for the Avengers has a, its whole, whole game set. Um, there's a whole historical gaming market. So there's people that play, you know, World War II, base games or you know military naval games um pretty much if you can think of a genre there's probably a miniature game for it now at, at some level 100 percent. the nice thing about a hobby like this too it's kind of like cars in a lot of way i think you're exactly bang on mark where like people get interested in it when they're teenagers or in their early 20s but they don't have the money necessarily to really and then it's later in life when they finally have the money to properly invest because like these models are are beautiful but they're also like very expensive <laughs> or can be. So yeah, <laughs> it's one of those nice things where, um, you know, work like you do, I think they're the perfect market for someone like you, I think in a lot of ways, because they clearly appreciate something that's well-made and like works well. So something you were showing some of the stuff from the 40K, you know, Warhammer pieces and stuff before. And a lot of the reviews on it, I mean, you have a lot of four and five star reviews that just say like works perfectly exactly what I needed kind of thing, right? They're, if you're going to sit and paint tiny, tiny miniatures for days on end, you appreciate the finer, small details of things. You know what exactly. I mean? Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of reviews, like 51 just for this one. That's that's pretty impressive. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and it and it's it, it is that type of market because it is it's a hobby based market, and it, like it, it's exactly what you say. People do it as a hobby; they do it to enjoy it, 
Yeah. And they're looking for stuff to enhance that, but they yeah. also appreciate they appreciate you're solving a problem. You're solving a major problem because they used to have to go through a, a 400 page manual to that one page and go on this table. And then once they, you know, they cross reference the table and then they, they get their result. You're just taking that, that table and just putting it into a into a, a handheld device. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the, yeah the, the manuals haven't gone away. I have literally stacks and stacks of books. And that's what it's. There's one thing with wargaming, manuals and tokens and dice. Uh, yep. they, they love to have lots of them. And that, and it, but that's really what I'm doing is like, how can I improve on what comes in a box? Because typically it's, they'll come with the tokens and the dice that you need, but they're typically, they're cardboard, you know, they're not, they're not horrible quality, but they, they're trying to keep the price as low as possible because they want to put out, you know, I shouldn't say as low as possible because some of these sets go for three to four hundred dollars for a box. Wow. So th these it. are not these are not ten dollar models. I mean, you could, one individual Warhammer model could start basically from twenty five up to one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, bigger wow. ones for sure. Yeah. Yeah, like you get into the larger models, they're easily. Um, they released a few for their fantasy line just recently. That a single model, of granted, it's you know six seven inches tall it's almost $200 Canadian for one model. And that that's unpainted, that's unassembled. So it's, you get a box of parts for $200. Um, you sit down for maybe some people are fast and do it in a week. Some people take years to build and paint a single model. So it's, it, it is a hobby. And I think, I think that's why I've been successful in it in the fact that it's that niche of people are doing it for enjoyment. They're not, these aren't, things they have to buy um this is to enhance what they're doing so i think and i think that relates back to the reviews is that people appreciate it because it is adding to their ability to enjoy the hobby um where it's not like i have to buy this because i need it therefore i probably am not going to bother reviewing it because it's you know it's it's just utilitarian where this is like people people appreciate i think the work that's gone into it and i think a lot of it too is i think they like buying from a small company they mm. they want it's that bespoke handmade even though it's it's being made on a laser um it's not mass produced in china uh, yeah not, there's, not a, there's a there's you, a the, you're only one step away from the uh, the maker when you buy that and i think this is a really big trend um that's on the uptick too is that you're you're purchasing uh something that you're one step away from the guy who designed it and made it and it's like i don't know it's almost i'm buying this from some kind of a celebrity and this is you know this we've we're like mass producing celebrities via youtube and things <laughs> like like this but it still doesn't it doesn't take away from the celebrity status and so you're like wow i mean i just spoke last night to a a one of my youtube heroes on email and i was like oh i was so excited i got to, i got to talk to who's like, that uh, his uh, name is Kendall from the Recording Lounge. It's a oh, cool. It's a, it's a m music thing, but uh, but to buy products from these people now, you're like, oh, I got it from this guy who I've been watching um, on social media for so long. They they, they actually become celebrity status, and it, it, you just happen to make fantastic product. Well, that's a winning combination right there. It's I'm funny. Go ahead, sorry, and a lot of it, yeah, and a lot of it is too. I think it, like you say, it is when people message me, they're they're talking to me. So I do it like I do a lot of custom requests. So someone said, "Hey, can I get this with our club logo on it?" Or can I get this with my name on it? I do it, and because because I'm making everything to order, there, there's only there's I make a few kind of core pieces maybe in a batch, but pretty much like every week. I bring in orders and I make it to order. So for me to change text on something is not a big problem because I, I don't have an inventory. Um, so if you want this tweaked and hey, I can do that for you, that's drawing a lot of people in. And it's also, those people appreciate it, but they also come back next time. It's like, hey, I bought this from you you know, last year. Could I get something new? And it may be a customization of an existing product or a lot of times I'll have people going, Hey, do you play this game or what do you know about it? I'd like you to build, you know, take this product that you did for Warhammer, but I'd like it modified, you know, this way for this other game. Can you do it? And 
ninety percent of the time, it's the answer is yeah, I can probably do that, and and then then that, and typically that and that becomes a new product that I end up selling. So it's, I may not have designed it originally to be just okay. I'm just going to shoot in the dark and put it on the Etsy store. Um, it came in as a request from that, uh, from that person. So that that really helps me drive my business because they're kind of doing the market research in a sense. Like okay, that. If they if they feel there's if there's one person feels there's a demand for something there's probably two people, um, and I well, really don't need to sell hundreds of everything because I'm not making hundreds of them. I was I was going to say too to that point I think I have very rarely in my life met a fan of tabletop gaming that was a very that was sort of a passive fan like people who tend to <laughs> invest in this game are are very dedicated to it and and love it and so to that point I mean if you if you equip somebody with a really cool bespoke, you know, counter or, or piece of some sort and send them off to their game night, the other people there are going to notice and sort of go, Hey, where did you get that cool? You know, whatever it is kind of thing. Right. I mean, the, the entire community can kind of appreciate. And I think to, to your point also, James, I think they appreciate that um, they're buying it from somebody else who clearly also understands the game, right? It's not yeah. somebody trying to capitalize on just Warhammer 40 K is a big name. It's somebody who actually knows here's something that would be useful whether it mm -hmm. comes to you from, um, you know, playing the game uh, exclusively, or as you say, from, you know, people recommending to you, hey, I play this game and there's not really a good way to do X, you know, could you help us kind of thing. Um, could I pop up that question from- uh, Yeah, from I, I was just gonna ask what, what James was, uh, I was just gonna say what James was saying about uh, fans. Uh, so um, uh, Enchantour, uh, it's Thomas from from Belgium. We actually had him on, on the show a couple months ago. Hey, hey, Thomas. If you guys, by the way, have any questions for Mark, uh, please post them in the chat. We, we definitely ask him. So uh, Thomas is asking, uh, I wanted to ask him how long, how much time it took for R&D, the products. And I guess you mentioned that with a lot of the other, um, you know, a lot, a lot of your customers coming up to you and telling you what they want. But do you, do you do any kind of separate R&D for, for these? Yeah, I, I'm typically, because of the way the gaming market works, there's always some either new version of an existing game coming out or a new game coming out. Um, so a lot of times I'm trying to stay kind of ahead of, okay, what's the next big release that's coming out in a month? Because once that comes out, people are going to want to buy accessories for it. Um, so a lot of the research is kind of looking looking at new games to see, okay, is are there accessories can, that I can make for it? Um, and in some games, there's not, and it or there, there's games that yes, I could make stuff for it, um, but it wouldn't really add a lot of value. So I tend not to like. I don't make everything that's possible, and I also there's some items I may get requested for. It's like, hey, could you make this? And it's like, I don't really see how it benefits the game. Now, mm. if someone wants to pay me enough, I'll make anything, but. There, there's but you won't, you won't post that, it on the store necessarily, right? Not necessarily because it's, I, I like to have, I, I think part of the popularity is I make items like that you mentioned, like that work in the game and that are, add value to it. It's like, because I, I could make a lot of other items that yeah, you could use it in the game. Um, it wouldn't add value or wouldn't speed things up or make the process better. Uh, so I tend not to go like, okay, what's every possible thing I could make? Yeah, there are plenty of people who just make bespoke tokens to replace the kind of the cardboard ones that come with games. And it doesn't really improve the effect of playing the game at all. It just replaces, you know, one component for an identical opponent that's maybe slightly nicer. And it's why, it, I, I, just me personally, I think what you do is far more valuable, just, you know, IMHO, I guess. Yeah, and there and there are in some cases I will just do almost a straight duplication. It's like okay, it came with cheap cardboard tokens, and people want to have acrylic tokens, and that's fine. I tend, but I tend not to. It's like if I'm going to make something, I'd like to put my unique spin on it, where it's like, okay, there is no other product like this, but it solves the same problem. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are looking for, because you know, when when they're playing games, when we're not in lockdown, when we used to be able to. Group, go out in groups people are going out and they want to have something unique when they put it on the table because it's almost like you know they're not trying to one up their opponent but it's like oh but look at this cool thing that i'm using as, as opposed to that cardboard piece that came in the box um so it's it's they're looking for something that you know it, to me it's got to look good it has also got to be functional um 
there's a lot of competitors in this market. I'm by far not the only person making this. There's people all over the world. There's a number of them are running Trotec lasers. I know there's there's a couple of companies in New Zealand, Australia. They have like five and six, you know, speedy 300s that are producing similar product. Um, and some of the, and it's not to say their stuff is not good. There's a lot of great stuff out there, but I also see a lot of, you know, here's some tokens, here's some MDF cut items. And I, and I look at them and I go, I'm not going to buy that. It's like, it doesn't, it's not visual appealing. Um, yes, it, it's a replacement, but maybe it doesn't solve the problem that I think it does. But other, but again, different taste for different people. I, I, you know, I watch my competitors on Etsy and I see their reviews and it's people, people love certain things. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, the biggest thing that gets me picked on the laser side is I'll see something that's like, you know, here's plain MDF and I make a few plain MDF items, um, but it's completely stained and laser burned. And that's what they're selling. It's like, I would, I wouldn't even sell it. I just, I can't mm. put that out. If I wouldn't use it myself, I really can't sell it because it's not about just churning out something for the money it's like and that's i think the game comes back to the reviews it's i go into with the mindset of i want to get a five-star review so don't release a product that it's going to be you know yeah it's okay but it's like yeah it's three out of five because it wasn't worth it or it's not as clean looking or it's made out of a you know substandard material i just rather not deal with that i mean i'd rather put out i want to be on the higher end of it if i'm going to do it to separate myself yeah and i think the pricing definitely i mean i i didn't see the competitor pricing but it's i mean this stuff isn't exactly cheap you know what i mean i mean it's custom made it's it's beautiful and uh actually that that comes to another question from uh, from Javon from Botswana, also a Trotec laser user. We had him on the show too. Hey, Javon, uh, do you engrave, cut, and paint fill any acrylic for the token pieces, etc., or do you mostly work with painted wood? If both, which materials do you prefer and why? Yeah, that's one thing that I don't do is paint infills. Uh, main reason for not ever doing paint infills is the time that it adds. Um, because basically you're making it, engraving it, then you have to paint infill it, let it dry, seal it. Now you've taken something that I can maybe produce in five, 10 minutes is now probably a minimum of 24 hour turnaround. Um, and where I'm not producing it in inventory, I just really don't want to get into that. So I tend to choose materials that I don't have to do that. So my choice of woods are always, will it engrave dark enough that it's readable? Um, so I use a lot of a lot of painted um, hardboard, um, a lot of the the Trotec veneer woods, um, mainly because if they because they are hardboard core, they tend to engrave dark. Um, a lot of trolleys, um, and that's really that's my substitution for paint infill is to use trolleys because then I get the benefits of both. I get high contrast, quick to produce. Um, now, again, I'll get questions from people it's like, oh, I'd really like that, but can, can you do this color? And it's like, well, here's the list of colors that are available. <laughs> and typically that's not a problem. Uh, but some people some people get very specific. It's like, oh, I've painted my army this very specific color of green. I'd like to duplicate it. It's like, yeah, I don't do that. It's, you know, here I try to keep a wide selection. Um, that's going to be something that's close. Um, but yeah, the, like you say, on the paint infill, another thing that I typically don't do, although I think, yeah, that, that's one of the few places that I make something that's out of um, a clear acrylic. Again, if it doesn't engrave dark enough to be readable, um, I don't want to have to paint infill that where a lot of our competitors would take that very same product, do it, but then they would do a paint infill to get a higher contrast. Again, the time that that adds to the process um, and be able to get consistent quality doing paint infill, you're going to end up, you're going to have a certain percentage of waste just because you paint infill something and it doesn't come out right. You can't always clean it enough to fix it. So it's really, you know, is it going to be usable? How, and then if I have to do that, I've now doubled the price at least. Um, so you basically price yourself out of the market by doing that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jovan was saying, oh, sorry, yeah, totally agree with, uh, oh, sorry, it wasn't, wasn't Jovan, Thomas, yeah, uh, Thomas, yeah. Uh, totally agree with the time consuming to add a, something extra. Sometimes it's not worth the added value, but I work on only wood, so I'm not objective. <laughs> yeah, and again, it, it, it would depend what I'm making. I mean, in cer certain things, I mean, if it's if it's a higher end item, I'm not opposed to doing paint infills and extra finishes. It's been more of the market that I've been going at is kind of in that, 12 to 60 dollar range so you know small for a couple of reasons one that's people are more apt to buy smaller end items um so it's, it's a balancing act um two it's got to be small enough to easily ship because 99 percent of what i do is all online um so you start getting into making like say i want to make a, a large acrylic sign yeah i can do that but then i got to ship it um, so packaging it up, the cost of shipping it, you're now dealing with a $200 item that's probably going to cost $100 to ship it. So you have a $300 sale. You're not going to get 50 of those a week. So it's, mm. and it's, but again, if you mean, if someone comes to me, you know, and, I, and I've had requests, it's like, Hey, could you, could you cut the parts out? I need it for a sign. It's like, a, you know, I'll do some kind of job shop work um more just people know that i have a laser and will do it but typically i tend not to um i like making my own things because i can put my spin on it as opposed to someone comes to you looking for something very specific they want what they have in their head can i ask then mark maybe this is a tough question to sort of phrase but i i think the way you're sort of talking about dividing your time between doing job shop work and then, you know, the sort of R and D and the extra wanting to add your kind of personal spin to things. I'm curious. Um, so often I think if you can find a way to add something you're passionate about to the work that you do, it will come through. And clearly I think, you know, you've, you've found that, uh, you know, and sort of speaking about not wanting to release something that you yourself wouldn't use is a, is a pretty good indication of, of that, I think, but I'm curious, you know, what is it that's that's in it um, for you? I mean, obviously, like it's a it's a profession, which is nice, but you know, what is it that drives you to want to make the work? What what is the your favorite part of it? Is it R and D on a new project? Is it you know being able to make something custom for somebody? Like, what's the part that really gets you excited every day to 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 work? It's definitely the designing new, new items. Like, I, I enjoy the process of like, okay, what what can I bring to this? new game or you know this this new item that's in a game that you know doesn't really have a, an ideal solution so it's for me it's really it is the r d it's the sitting down an illustrator to come up with something that's going to work um finding a material that works for the game because a, a lot of what i try to do um it it needs to fit the look and feel of the game too it's like you know a, a lot of the stuff i have like there's probably a hundred different versions of a dial that counts from zero to ten um but every one has a different it may have a different material it may have a different font it may have a different layout because it's specific to the game you're using it in um now a lot of that so on those for r d on those it's like okay i take an existing item i might resize it i might change the font and i'm done so the, those are quick and easy. I can add them to the store. But then there's other cases, um, there's a new game that's come out. Okay, what does it need? And it, it, I think that's really what drives me is being able to sit down and do the R&D of like, okay, I want to make up something new for this because I know, one, it's, it's new, so I like the enjoyment of it. And I also like to see what the reaction is from the community. It's like, here's my concept of what I think will work. Um, and a lot of cases, I get lucky and that, that works well, but then I'll also get a lot of feedback that I feed back in and say, Oh, I never thought of that. Let me modify it. So it's kind of that you get immediate feedback, particularly where I'm doing a lot of stuff on Instagram. So I'll put something out there and I'll get feedbacks like, Oh, but what about this? Or, Hey, could you make it, you know, in this type of layout? Well, and I mean, for a game like Warhammer, I mean, the level of customization that, you know, it's not even just fitting the game, but then also even fitting the specific army that the person's asking you for, you know what I mean? Like my army needs a, this logo and a, this particular type of font and a, this, like I said, this particular type of green, if even possible. So exactly. You know, there's, there's customization on customization on customization. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Uh, I was say, and that's in a lot of cases, like I'll have just a generic, like here's a dial. And then it, but then it comes back to it's like, Hey, can you do it with this army's logo? Or here's my, 
club logo that we have, or here's a, we're going to have an event. Could you do an event version of it? So it's in those, it's, it's a quick turnaround because it's like, it, it's in illustrator. I can go in and change it and I'm making a new version of it. So it's, you know, going from concept to the laser, depending on what it is. I mean, if it's something totally new. I may do 10 revisions until I'm happy with it on other ones. It's like, if it's swapping out a logo, 30 seconds, I can have it on the laser. Uh, so it's, you know, and, and something that makes like set me apart too, is I typically don't charge for that customization. Um, I just kind of price my products and the fact that if someone comes to me with an idea, sometimes I gain on it because now it's a new product. Other times it's like, yeah, I put some time into a customizing it for a one-time sale, but in the hopes that I'm also having a customer, maybe not for life, but you, know, you have a loyal customer because you've helped them in the past and they didn't, you know, if I had to charge a $75 setup fee for the, every time I customize it, I would not sell these custom items. So it's, okay. but that's in the workflow of how I've made it. I've set it up where it's like, I design not every product, but a lot of the products with customization in mind to know, okay, here's the spot where I'm going to put a generic logo that can be swapped out if someone does ask for it. So it makes that process easy. Well, and you know, Mark, you're you got some, uh, sorry, Mark, you got some hold down clamps there on the, uh, on the rulers. Look like you had some clamps. Yeah. Holding down. Cool. Yeah. On the, yeah, I've basically yeah. I would, I've gone through a few different revisions on that. Those are my latest, basically screwed down pieces of acrylic. Just to hold the edges so things don't warp or anything like that? Or yeah, typically move? what I find because I'm do typically I'm majority of what I use is all usually three mil or one eighth material. Um, and typically like the veneer stuff or troll legs usually lays pretty flat. Where I get into issues is more when you paint it, it because it's only painted one side, but I also buy pre-finished acrylic. Um, and if it's only finished on one side, it always curls. Um, so it's really just to, there's not a lot of warp, but it's really just, I just need that to hold it down. So it's, uh, yeah, I pretty much use that daily just to get that, uh, just the edges so everything lays flat. Did you make a frame and then you just set it against the rulers? And that, then that's actually, little... yeah, no, that's just the standard um, um, Trotec. Um, drilled uh, right into the ruler. Trade over, drilled right yeah. into the. Yeah, gotcha. so that's the honeycomb grid with just, I basically, gotcha. I said, yeah, I didn't like drilling into it, but I said, screw it. It's like, it's just the edge of the grid. It's like, what difference does it make? Hey, you're a maker, right? It's, it's gonna make yours. It. Yeah. <laughs> I know somebody yeah. who, who painted their, their speedy pink. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah. It was pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Was it you, James? Miguel. It was it's Miguel. Not. Yeah. Miguel. <laughs> no, it He's was cool. That is cool, actually. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you, Mark, do you, did you ever do any type of acrylic inlay or wooden acrylic inlay, like one into another as opposed to engraving? I've done it for custom pieces more, not so much on the gaming side, more for kind of more bespoke kind of typical gift type items or some, I've done some signage that way with inlays. Um, again, it's more, it's a more a time and cost item. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's really, if it's something on the higher end, I'll probably look at doing that. What, one of the things that I'm looking to do that I haven't, which is kind of a cross between that and the paint infill is actually doing more of an epoxy with a metallic, uh, powder infill. Oh, cool. Uh, so you could take, you know, take particularly something like take, for example, like the cherry, uh, veneer wood, you know, laser engrave that do basically uh, an aluminum or a brass powder infill with CA glue and then sand it off and you get that metallic finish um, on my list of things to do. But again, more for something more like building a higher end, maybe collector's box where you want to have that engraving, but you know, something with a bit more pop to it. But again, a step away from just doing a paint infill. One thing I'm surprised, uh, and maybe you could sort of speak to this, this might be a little bit too inside baseball, but um, one thing I'm surprised uh, I didn't see on your shop, and maybe I just missed it, but was um, cases to carry models. One of the most different, th like difficult things about this hobby is that you paint up 200, you know, little soldiers in different necks and tanks and things, and then you have to find some way of safely transporting these very precious little Fabergé eggs to a game night <laughs> and get them there and get them home along with the dice and everything else. So I was, I was curious, I mean, 
that's a that's something where I feel like nobody has really come to the perfect solution, maybe. But uh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm out of the <laughs> out of the loop. No, no, no. That's that's definitely the, and there are a lot of companies making that. I think the challenge I've had there, and I think you hit the nail on the head, is there there isn't a perfect solution. Mm. Uh, and I and I've played around with a few different boxes and making box inserts for it. Um, the challenge has always been because they are such delicate items a lot like you can buy third-party ones that are basically um foam core cut pieces so you know basically sh shapes cut out for each model that fits in a in a foam insert which i've considered doing it because i know i can do that on the laser is doing you know do i want to start doing that the challenge then becomes they're very specific to every single model um so there may be literally 300 different models in one army that you need a separate cutout. So now I have to own each of those to make yeah. that. Um, so I really haven't gone down that path. It is something, the other part I haven't done a lot on, I do some is, is also terrain elements as well, where a lot of companies, there's a huge market for MDF terrain. Um, again, I haven't done a lot just because there's a lot of competition in that area. And it's, what I find it, it's bigger pieces. It's again, bigger to ship. B bigger to cut it's more material so you're you know time goes up to make it cost goes up to make it um, shipping time and expense goes up um certainly not opposed to it and then, here's an example like i've started making cases for accessories mm -hmm. um so getting into that market and that's kind of been my first steps into it is like okay can we take that without me getting specific to the model it's it's almost making cases for the own items that I make, which is, it, it's kind of an add on piece to what I'm selling down the road. And, and so, and a lot of people, you know, some people ask for that other people don't because, you know, it's like, if I'm going to spend that money, I'd rather have a nice accessory, but I don't need the nice box. Um, so it, 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 again, it varies for some people I've had requests. It's like, I like your stuff, but I want a carrying case for it. So it's, you know, I do get those those requests not as not as often, but certainly they do happen. That is this hobby too. People who want carrying cases to carry the accessories that they've bought for for their carrying cases. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's very much a collector's market. So it's like, you know, there's a lot of people, including myself. You do more collecting than you do playing. It's yeah. It's the idea that someday I'm going to go play. Yeah. You may never get finish there. painting. So, these is that you with the trailer dollars. park boys? Yeah, that was. <laughs> Probably almost ten that's probably ten or fifteen years ago. Yeah, we had won a contest through Future Shop wow. in the old days. Um <laughs> to Canadian Music Week in Toronto and part of it was we ended up hanging out with them in their penthouse. So that's crazy. Wow. Sorry about which that. I just I, I thought that interesting. <laughs> I was like, oh that's cool. Which, which is funny <laughs> because it's it's basic it's literally filmed like twenty minutes from my house. Um oh, so you fly wow. so you fly to Toronto to basically drink beer with guys that are basically from the same town so <laughs> <laughs> very cool um speaking of uh, lasers in general i mean how did you hear about lasers g going back i mean you've obviously you've been in this industry for for a bit of time uh, how did you hear about lasers in general uh i've always kind of been in that kind of like i say the whole making background so you know i had i have a, a mini lathe um, you know, I have a 3D printer, you know, we, I've always had stuff growing up, you know, we always had welders and, you know, uh, paint sprayers and, you know, always had tools around and it's like, and coming from that technical background, it was always like, you'd always see like a YouTube video of someone doing something with a laser and it's like, okay, that's, that's the coolest thing ever. That's, that's the tool I want to have. Um, and I've had, and prior to that, I, I own a CNC machine as well. So I used to do um, custom parts for drones, um, some woodworking, um, which is great. And, and the CNC was originally kind of the path I had gone down. Um, the challenge, I should say challenge, the, C, the problem with CNC is it's so time consuming and it's, and it's messy and there's, a, and it's a lot of post cleanup. You know, it, it gets you to a step, but then you're still down to, you know, sanding and finishing and the cleanup and the noise and it's slow. Um, and depending on what you're making, it's the proper tool. When I started making and where I get kind of crossed over is like I started doing um, CNC coasters and, and basically signs. So I did Game of Thrones plaques and that sort of thing on the CNC, which was great. 
But when you step back and say, okay, for me, by the time I take my materials, my time to finish it, you're selling a high end item really to be profitable. You can't, to mass produce it, you really got to be running your CNC 24 seven and have a team that's basically doing finishing for you to really, if you want to go into that market where it's a little bit trickier to do just kind of one-off bespoke items. Um, I mean, right now for the stuff that I make, if I had to do this on a CNC, I'd go insane because literally, okay, I got to run out and, and cut one item. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not realistic. So I started looking, it's like, okay, what else is out there that, you know, fits into, hey, I want, I want to do everything that's maybe like, you know, a quarter inch or less. Um, here's the type of material I want to work with. And and that's where really I started looking into lasers. It's like, okay, it engraves. I can use acrylics. Um, then you start finding stuff like trolleys. It's like, oh, I could even do stuff where I don't even have to paint it. Um, and then it was, then it was really, okay. So what if all the lasers out there, you know, you start looking, there's, um, there's Glowforge, there's um, some companies out in Las Vegas that I wasn't going to buy from because I heard too many horror stories. Hmm. Um, there was that was going to be my next question. Uh, in a shameless <laughs> self-promotion, uh, why why did you choose Trotec? Glow who? It Glow. <laughs> yeah. it's like, for what? <laughs> why, why, why didn't I f choose full spectrum? I went with Trotec. Um, and, and I had looked at Chinese ones as well because really when I looked, realistically i look I, and i looked at full spectrum it's like well i might as well buy it from china because really that's what i'm getting um and then at least i'm the master of my domain and that i'll deal with all the headaches because i know what i'm getting myself into um but then looking at it, it's like if i'm going to do production which was my intent is like i did i didn't want this just as this is just a hobby tool that i'm going to use you know once a month if i'm going to get this i want something that i can do production on um and when you start reading is Chinese laser is not the way to go if I'm going to do production, particularly where I'm taking orders and producing them in the same week. So if I don't have the ability to create that product that I just someone paid me for, you know, what am I going to do? I can't be down for a month waiting on a tube from China. Um, so it started looking at it and, you know, I, it really came down to basically Epilogue and Trotec. Um, and from my research and actually talking with Mike and it was, I felt Trotec was the better tool. Just a lot of it basically for the, the speed was a big one on the engraving side. Um, that's probably the, was kind of the, the final factor and two being available in Canada. So I didn't have to deal with importing something be, from China or the U S um, I didn't have to deal with, you know, with full spectrum. That was kind of, there's a lot of reasons I didn't go with that. One was, okay, it's got to, got to ship it from the U.S. I got to deal with a U.S. company if anything goes wrong. Not that that's horrible, um, but I'd much rather deal with someone in the country. Um, it just, you know, it, it's easier, you know, there's no local rep, but you guys come down here. I've, you know, I've met you guys and talked to you and I can call you up. I can order supplies online. Um, that was, that was probably the, you know, quality speed and then just having a Canadian based reseller was it was kind of the final final decision well, that's very interesting and i mean in terms of uh, i guess we get these questions um quite often but i mean how do you uh, you don't have to get into the details of it but how do you generally price jobs on, on new products we get that all the time uh, yeah it's generally with what i'm doing because there are competitors. So it's, you know, it, it's seeing what's in the market already, because I mean, I can't come in at like, if someone's making something similar, I, I'm not selling it for, I can't sell something for 10 times that price. So in some products I'll look at them as like, okay, there's literally, there is no margin to make whatever that accessory is. So I'm just not going to make it. Um, so I could certainly make it, but not, not to make, you know, you're breaking even at the end of the day. Cause I, you know, particularly on Etsy, um, you got to be careful because if you price it based on your competitor, I can look at half the stores out there. It's like, there is no way on earth they are making money. It is impossible. Um, it's like they even, they're doing this basically as a pastime. And a lot of people on Etsy do. And that's one of the challenges. It's like, they're not pricing it based on what it's worth or, you know, what people will pay. It's like, oh, I made this thing. And if I sell it for $5, that's great. Cause I just like making them. Um, which is fine, but those stores come and go. So what I tend to do is run looking at the market in some of them, it's like, okay, I could sell something 
it's going to be double that because I'm going to put my spin on it. So there is there is a, a spot to work it in there. And then the pricing, you know, around that is it's really material costs and in, in laser time. So it's like, you know, and that's why the small items are nice. It's like, okay, this this item takes, you know, 30 seconds to a minute on the laser time. It's easy to price out and it's costing me, you know, that a sheet of material, if it's, if it's trolleys, it's, you know, it's more expensive than it is dealing with hardboard. Um, but it's still within the realm of like, if I'm selling something that's, you know, three by three inches, you're not talking hundreds of dollars of material. Um, and that's why I tend not to do a lot of like, like that video there is actually some prototype terrain that I make. Um, that I'll probably eventually sell. The challenge there is because it's so large and there's so many pieces, now my laser time has gone way up. Um, so if I spent, if I take that and it takes me say, uh, that there didn't take hours, but say, say I made something that's gonna take me an hour to cut out. It's like, okay, now I have to charge an hour of laser time on top of the material as well. So you gotta look at it in the fact is like, is that going to be a viable product for this market is like, is someone going to pay a hundred dollars for a bundle of MDF? Probably not. Um, where I, but I do. And that's where you, and particularly too, with some of this too, you have a lot of competition from China. It's like not so much on some of this stuff, but there are parts of the kind of the gaming market where they make box inserts for board games. It's like, well, I can buy it from China for $5. Well, there is no market to make it in Canada. Like mm -hmm. you just, so you just have to say, okay, that that's outside of the realm of what's viable because no one's going to pay for it because someone else is doing it cheaper, how they're doing it cheaper. I'm not sure, but there's nothing I can do about it. So it's really, it's, you know, I, I try not to focus too much on the competition, but you do still have to look out there because someone's going to come to you and say, it's like, why is your stuff five times more than, you know, particularly if they're making something of equal or close quality, um, where a lot of the stuff, that's why I tend to not do a lot of stuff that's just plain MDF. There's a lot of that out there. I don't like the look of it. And two, that's where I can also, that's my added value is like, I'm using different material. For sure. I'm, I'm going to add some, uh, some questions here from, well, questions and comments. Uh, Darren from, uh, I think Langley, BC. Hey, Darren, thanks for, for your comment. I agree with Mark. Uh, we have a Speedy 300 in our classroom, use it daily over the last five to six years and never had an issue. Just like tools, you get what you paid for it. Thank you for that, Darren. Hope you will join us on the show one of these uh, months. Um, and Thomas said, uh, I agree with Mark, no matter what the specs, if you can rest secured that the machine will do what you're asking for it to do, uh, you can focus on the creative part or the processing part. And he also adds, if the machine can be uh, become an issue, you're never quite in the making. Oh, you're never quite in the, the making process. Sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to quickly ask James if you don't mind. This is something you've spoken about before, and and I was trying to explain it to somebody the other day, and I don't think I did a very good job. And it sort of relates to what Mark is talking about. So I was hoping to hear it from the man himself. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, shame on you. Uh, James used to run his own engraving business prior to working for Trotec. If I'm, I'm that's I mean a fair assessment, right? Um, I remember you once talking yeah. about not yeah. doing yeah. sort of race to the bottom pricing because you sort of devalue the work of everyone in the market. That yeah, that you kind of have to be careful about everyone. how you price. Yeah, you know that you want to be com competitive, but then at the same time, you know you want people to understand that what you do takes time and and effort and is work. You know. Yeah, I mean, you've 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 spent you know ten years learning to design. Let's say uh, you've went to school, you've paid all this money to design. Uh, you've bought uh, expensive graphics programs. You buy the best laser in the industry. You sit down with your you know hundred and twenty five thousand uh, dollar world, which is you know basically everything that you've you've learned, all the hours you've put into schooling, all the money you've put in, and then you sit down. Uh, and you make a product and then you suddenly just drop the price to get the, the business. Um, and this is your sales tactic. Well, you know, race to the bottom doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, I've seen, I've seen companies come drop their prices to get all the work, work till three in the morning, hate their job and quit and go do something else. Oh, that didn't work. Um, whereas if you were able to, make a quality product, make a better product in some way uh, and to 
be able to talk about your product better, to spend your time learning about mar marketing and you know getting uh, getting this kind of quality footage out to the, the people. You don't have to be the cheapest in the industry. Yeah. You don't. I, I don't buy the, the cheapest thing. Um, uh, if the thing that I need is awesome and it happens to be the cheapest, okay, sure, deal for me. But I don't go out and search for the, the cheapest thing. It's a it's it's a false economy, really. So, yeah. yeah, yeah and I think it's, it's kind of extending on that, too. I think a lot of it, too, is and it relates back, I think, to the number of high reviews I get. It's the customer service side as well. So you're paying that in the price. I mean, I get... I get messages all the time, and it's like I tend. I'm, and from my IT days, I'm this is I'm my own worst enemy. I tend to reply immediately. Um, if someone has a question, I I don't like it waiting 24 hours to get an answer, uh, which you set yourself up because that's the expectation. But that's also people people appreciate that because you are getting back to them. So I, I mean, I've had particularly now with COVID and a lot of shipping delays, I'll get particularly if I'm sending internationally, things that might have taken two to three weeks before are taking a month plus. Um, so people, you know, they buy something online, um, for particularly when it's the first time, they don't know you from a hole in the ground. It's like, okay, I bought this a month ago and it's still not here. Okay, what's going on? Um, so you'll get these emails that, and they're not they're not trying to be mad or anything, but you, you can tell even in text the tone of like, okay, where's my stuff? And a simple reply back, you know, as long as it's timely, it's like, hey, sorry for the issue. I'm tracking it down. Here's the latest tracking information. You know, I'd say, you know, you're looking at probably another week. That's the reality of the world we're in today. Um, if you don't have it by Friday, you know, drop me a note. I'll see what I can do. And if it goes missing, I give them a refund. It's like, it's out of my pocket, but I'd rather do that because I've been on the other end of that where it's like you buy something yeah, and you're waiting six weeks later. I still haven't got it. They've not replied to emails. It's like, I'm never buying from them again. So particularly with this, where I have a lot of repeat customers, I'm building up that goodwill as price. So in the pricing, you know, I need to take that into account. I spent a lot of time just on, you know, customer service. Now, granted, it's easy. One nice thing with the laser is laser's doing something. If I get a message, I can reply to it in between jobs. So I, I like to stay on top of it. Um, but again, it, it comes back in that pricing where if you're buying that, if I'm buying a $5 item on Etsy, I'm not expecting that I'm probably ever going to hear from the guy. It's like, you know, it's just, that's the reality. Cause they're, if they're pricing that low one, they're probably, if they're getting a lot of sales, then they're not going to be able to maintain it. So they're not going to maintain replying to customers either. Um, so I, you know, that's, that's part of, I've always just been that way where customer service is, is critical. It's not just, you can produce the greatest thing in the world, but you have one bad experience. And someone goes online and says, these guys are garbage. They never get back to you. Um, they make nice stuff, but took too long to get here. You, you know, there's there's a million different reasons why someone won't buy something. Having a, having a nice product um, is only one of them, really. Absolutely, yeah. I was, I was just going to, sorry, I was going to add uh, Javon's comment here. I've experienced the same with cake toppers, for example. A customer can buy a cheap, flimsy one from a store or uh, for cheap, or they can get one customized by us for a high-quality troll glass, which is the acrylic, at a premium. So, yeah, thank you, Javon. That's exactly what we're yeah. talking about, too. There's a, there's a, to that point, I think it's it's as much about being able to, to justify why yours and to demonstrate for the customer why yours might be a little bit more expensive and why that might be important right it, it, a lot of it comes down to marketing right mike <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of COVID, actually, uh, you, you touched up on that. Uh, so obviously the, the delays in shipping were affected. Was, did you feel anything else in terms of like the business being affected? Like there's less orders coming in, especially in, in the spring in the, earlier this year? Yeah, when it first started, I mean, it, in part, I think no one knew what was going to happen. So it was kind of like, okay, we just sit and wait. Um, <laughs> we had actually, once the lockdown started, we actually ended up, we closed down basically our shops for I think probably two to three weeks, uh, mainly just not knowing if I take orders today, is, is there even going to be mail on Friday when I go to ship them? 
Uh, so there was that complete unknowns. We basically took a small window and just said, okay, let's just wait and see. Um, but then we be, we reopened after that and really it's, I think I checked before I went on the call, I think we're up 30% in sales from last year. Now part oh, of that is, well. part of that is just adding more product and being more known. So like, you know, you get, it's, it's it grows on itself. Like people now it's like in the game industry, I would say like I'm a big name, but it's like a lot of people that will now know us as a place to get accessories where last year we were still growing that. Um, but I think a lot of it too is a lot of people are sitting at home playing with their models. So it's not really that the, actually the game and industry in general, like if you take the company that um, games workshop that runs Warhammer, I think they're having their largest year ever. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Because it's, it's something people can do at home. So even though you're not getting to play with other people, they're, they're buying models. They're everyone's buying for the day that things open up. Um, so I think we've, we've kind of fallen into that. It's like, well, it's an, people are sitting on their computers online, looking at stuff they're sitting on Etsy going through. It's like, well, that's cool. I should buy that. Um, the where it's hit us, probably the biggest though, it, it's really been the shipping. Um, right now, I, I for the last month I've stopped international shipping. Um, I, it just, it's so unpredictable. Um, I just oh, can't we feel your about, pain. Yeah, <laughs> like I just don't know when or if a product's going to get there. So I end up, you know, customers. So I ended up, you know, not, not a lot, but I've done basically, I just written stuff off where it hasn't arrived in over a month. I just give people a refund. It's just, you know, and, and I'm never going to get that product back. Or if I do, like I, I actually got a product back from a, like, that was misdelivered it was a year to the date almost to the day that wow. i actually got a ship back from europe so it's like you're just not and that was before COVID. um so the whole mail system now which is really you know 90 percent of it gets delivered some of it goes missing for a, a while and gets delivered some of it gets returned and some of it just disappears um but it's the like but it's just not predictable so i can't say to someone that's buying in australia you'll have it in you know four weeks i've had cases where i've sent stuff during COVID that went to the uk in two weeks i've sent stuff to the uk that is over a month now and is still not delivered um it, it just things are going into a black hole almost at this point you just hope and pray uh, now within canada and the us that's not been as big as issue so that's where i've been focusing um for the last month i'll, I'll probably open things or I was planning to open things back up, but then the UK just went back into lockdown. So I'm again, it's like, well, is it worth it? You know, do I yeah, start speaking, shipping speak, to the UK? Speaking of the UK, Johnny Green's actually from the UK. He's uh, one of our Trotech family members uh, in the UK. Hey, Johnny, experience has its own value. If you train for 10 years to, to learn to make quality products in half an hour, as a customer, you're not paying for that half hour. You're paying for the 10 years. Yeah, great. Definitely wise words. Um, I guess my, my final question, uh, we're at the top of the hour now. Um, is there a point now where you're feeling like, okay, uh, like the laser, the machine's running constantly. I need a second machine. Is there, is there, or do you, do you see that in the foreseeable few, future where you're like, okay, I, there's too much work. I need to have two separate machines for the, for me. Yeah. I've actually in the, just in the last few weeks have been, it's been in the back of my mind. It's, it's more because it's a home base shop, it's easy. I can come out here and run the laser and I'm doing it. You know, it's not running 24 seven, but I also don't want to, it's, it's mainly just me. So it, if it's running 24 seven, I have to be there. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm finding now is where, where I can see the benefit would be is being able to run multiple jobs at once, or particularly if something takes 10 minutes to do, I could be putting another one on that. And particularly where I am making everything to order, if I have a run on orders in a particular week, it means I I'm working extra hours because, you know, I have to make, I still got want to make my shipping deadlines. Um, for other times, you know, there's enough of a gap where it's like, ah, eh, I go out for a couple hours, I can run some production and I don't have to worry about it. When it gets busy, that's where having that second one would be useful. But where I'm finding it lately is more getting back to the R and D side. Um, I'd like to have a second one. So it's, while it is cutting, I can be doing R and D on new items. Um, where now, what I tend to do is, I'll have a like, I have scraps of paper all over my desk that are basically, you know, here's a bunch of ideas, to, things to do. Um, but I'll never, get, I don't get to them right away because production comes first. Mm -hmm. uh, where 
I think that's where maybe adding something in the spring as a second machine would allow me to do one, I can do twice the production, but also it does free up where I can be using one to do new ideas where I'm not taking my time away from production to do it. So it's, it's definitely something I'm, I'm looking at. And I was actually I've been waiting, probably wait till the spring. And just again, with the whole COVID thing, it's just, you never know. Yeah. You, yeah. you never know where the mark and, I don't want to talk about the U S election, but that was also part of like not knowing what may happen in the U S because a lot of, it, a lot of your customers are down, down South. Yeah. It's probably like 80% U S wow. 10% UK. And I probably saw more of the UK than in Canada, but the bulk of it is the U S. So just, just the unknown of not knowing, like, are they going to go into a major recession where no one buys? Like, it's just, it, it, in between COVID and the election, it's just been, it, it hasn't it really impacted us, but you just never know. Like there's uncertainty. God, yeah. Yeah. God is like, God forbid. It's like, I don't know if at the end of the month, are they going to be in a civil war? I don't know. <laughs> like, let's hope not. So it's, you know, so it's, it's really, it's the big picture things like, yeah. Could I, would I like to have a second speedy sitting here? Yes. Uh, uh, and, and for us, what it's been to, and at the time it was like, I bought the Speedy 100, the 12 by 24, more not knowing like, okay, is that the size I want? But for what I'm making, it's ideal. Um, I don't, I don't make large items. And now that I've been through it for a while, it's like, I don't think I want to, because again, it comes back to that whole shipping side. Um, we're having, having two or three Speedy 100s means more to me than having like a 400. Cause I just, I can run multiple jobs versus big jobs. That's interesting. So I think it's for anyone that is looking, I think that's a, a big thing to look at is really what are you going to use it for in terms of, you know, bigger is always better, no matter what it is. Um, but again, it, what's going to work with your workflow? I'd still rather have like a 360 or a 400 just for that flexibility. But the reality is for what the niche that I'm in, you know, the wise decision was the speedy 100 because it fits fits the size um you know so again but for someone else if you're doing signs it's probably not the machine for you like if that's your market so it's really you know i, I kind of evolved the market to fit the machine in a lot of ways so it's kind of like you know it's a chicken or the egg mm. uh, but it, but for an existing business like now, now that i've used it i i know what I, i'd still want a 400 but i probably would buy another 100 because it makes the most business sense that's interesting. Uh, I mean, we're we're almost done. So, just I, I guess before we finish, um, do you have any, I guess, advice for for new laser users or people that are starting a business? Um, you know, any, anything from from your years of experience with it? Um, yeah, I think it's just doing doing your research on what you need. I mean, it it is a big decision. I mean, I mean, a laser in general is not a cheap purchase, and a Trotec is not in the big scheme of things. I mean, and I think that's the people need to do the research because you start looking at it's like, well, I can buy this for like $2,000 or I can buy this for $20,000. It's like, what's the difference? It's like, there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I think from the people from the outside, it's, it's difficult to justify that particularly for getting it as a, you're in a new business or want to start a new business. It's a major investment. I mean, we ended up leasing hours because of that. Cause you know, I could have gone out and just bought a cheaper laser. And it's like, or it's like the option was, but I could, I could lease a really good laser. Um, so it's, there are those decisions to be made. And I would think people to do that. Cause I mean, even a cheap laser, you're looking at five to $6,000. Um, and I have, and I'm still on social media and, and read a lot of laser groups and active in the community. It's like, there's not a day goes by that I regret getting the Trotec. Let's put it that way. It's just, I come out, I turn it on and it works. I don't have a bucket of water. I don't have cooling tubes. It's reliable. It's repeatable. Um, and when I see what some of the other people, you know, granted it's a lot cheaper, but I don't want to play laser repairman once a week. <laughs> it's just, so I think that you got to look at it. Are, do you, is it a tool or is it a hobby? You know, you know, well, I, th I think the other thing too, Mark, is if you spend all that extra time, you know, cleaning your product up and getting it out, how much time do you have for R and D? And your business is, it sounds like it's based a lot on you doing R and D and coming up with new ideas. And 
you only have so much time in the day, you know, and I remember the the guy that came in one day, he had a, he had a, you know, Chinese laser and he, he said, either I buy your machine or I get out of business. He said, because I'm yeah. just spending so much time. He said, I'm spending 80% of my time just trying to get product out of this machine that looks good to get it out the door. I'm not spending all, I should be, it should be the other way around. It should be 80% on, you know, artwork, marketing, you know, R and D and everything like that. And, you know, so yeah, it, and that, I think we're, there's a cost to that. Yeah. And I think we're, we're, I'm lucky in what, because I don't, I'm usually making my own items. It's, it would be less of an issue, but I've seen pieces where they're basically going in. It's like, Oh, someone wants me to engrave their guitar or their MacBook. It's like, well, you get one shot. I wouldn't even think of doing that on a Chinese machine because, Oh, and the belt slipped. Mm -hmm. well, what do you do now? You just destroyed a one-off item. Um, and even if you're doing like, even if you're doing models or whatever, every one that you ruin is money out of your pocket. Um, you know, it's, it's, I don't think the only time I've ever had an issue with the Trotec is because I've done something wrong. It's like, oh, I forgot the focus when I sw swapped in material or I picked the wrong setting, but it hasn't been the end of the world because I'm not doing those one-offs. When I do do those, I probably check my settings 10 times because it's like, okay, I don't want to ruin this item because I didn't, I can't just reproduce it for pennies. You know, I got to go, if, even if it's just a water bottle, it's like, you know, that's 10 bucks that you just, you're going to, yeah, I have a, a water bottle now with on my desk that I can use, but I can't sell it. Um, where I think that's where, you know, buying an actually truly industrial quality machine it removes that worry. I mean, it's, but even when I first had the Trotag, I mean, I'm looking at it's like, it's like, okay, how, how repeatable is it? How reliable is it? I just turn it on now. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a day I'll have an issue, but I mean, I've been running it now for, I think I've had it for over Let's three years. <laughs> um, and, and you, I mean, expect, you expect regularly, you know, cleaning it and it's something at some point, you know, the tube may need to be recharged or whatever, but it's not, you know, you see some horror stories. It's like, you know, with, oh, I, it breaks down every week or, you know, every day and someone's fixing it. It's like, I didn't buy it to be a project. I've been, like I said, I've been down the 3D printing path and it's where that's is 50% keeping it running and 50% making it. I didn't want that with the laser. It's like the laser is a tool to make things. It's not, it's not a project. Yeah. Playing laser repair man is my least favorite tabletop game. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you for all the passion. I mean, it's it's been really very amazing hour to, to find out about this. It, it, I definitely, I learned a lot, I'm sure, uh, the guys have here. And, um, you know, if, if you guys have uh, any comments for Mark, uh, you can find him at Schooner Labs, um, uh, his website, his Etsy store, um, his Instagram, he's very active there. Uh, say hello to him and um, yeah, thank you for your time, Mark. It's it's been it's been awesome. Yeah, no, and I appreciate Good job, uh, Mark. Appreciate having out on. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, yeah. thanks so much. All See right. you guys next you guys week. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care.